Bill. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's uh, Wednesday, the February 8th, and today is uh, Farm to School Day here at the Cat Toler. It's really good that, uh, to have you folks with us, and uh, we'll uh, we'll get started. We we've got uh, a couple of hours uh, that we can spend uh, with you, and uh, uh, I know you play a very important part in feeding our children, and uh, and. We worked a lot with uh, Senator Campion and the Ed Committee last year uh, in regards to uh, the Universal Meals Program on, on the Senate side. And if you uh, if you have any input on that, uh, certainly glad to hear your take on it. And we had some um, people in and. You know, most anything you do in the legislature, there's usually somebody that speaks against it. And uh, God, we can't seem to find anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I think if I remember right, last year when we uh, finally got to vote on that in the Senate, uh, the vote was 29 to 1. It was really a kind of a one-sided uh, deal, and you know, it's, and how we accomplished that was not from us, really. It was from people like yourselves that were out there promoting uh, school meals and how important it is, and, and uh, it was. Uh, a fun project to work on. Uh, the success of it was, uh, you know, terrific. And uh, so, anyways, uh, I'm glad that you're here today, and hopefully this year we can uh, get that to be a permanent uh, issue. And, uh, and it, you know, and everybody is better off. The only complaint I've ever heard is, well, those little rich kids don't need their meal paid for. Well, how many little rich kids are there in Vermont? You know, there's uh, some that are better off than others, but uh, it, it just is great that all children can go and have a good meal and a uh, good breakfast. Uh, but anyway, we'll get started and hear, hear from you folks. Do you want to lead off, Ben? Sure, thank you. Yeah. And your help was really uh, spectacular. On the, I mean, we've been at this for quite a yeah. while. Quite a while. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Chair. And thank you, Senators, for having us today. Um, and my name is Betsy Rosenbluth. I'm the Project Director of Vermont Feed which is a farm-to-school partnership of Shelburne Farms, where I'm located, and NOFA, Vermont. Um, and yes, today is Farm-to-School and Early Childhood Awareness Day. Um, it was a little tricky this year getting students in the building. It's a lot going on in schools, as you know. Um, but we have a list of, I think, some folks who can answer a lot of your questions and also live that experience and can talk about what's happening in the schools and early childhood programs. Um, so we're going to focus today um, our remarks on um, the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grants Program and the local purchasing incentive, which was passed just a couple of years ago, um, but happy, of course, to speak to the third leg of the stool, which is universal meals. Um, and I think, as the chair has often said, this is a win-win-win for Vermont. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the impact that we're seeing most recently on our students, communities, and our farmers. 
So we are asking you today to support the Farm to School in Early Childhood program with a level funded base appropriation of 500,000 for FY24 and to support the local purchasing incentive program at 500,000 in base funding. Vermont led the nation when we passed the Rosa McLaughlin Farm to School program back in 2007. So we were the first state to put in place a farm to school grant program. And most states now uh, have that in place or have legislation to create it. Um, and it, was be it began by supporting schools with both technical assistance and the grant fund. So it's that combination that's really helped the participation. And what we've seen is over 200 grants have gone to early childhood programs in schools over the years. Um, we continue to be national leaders in Farm to School when we expanded the Farm to School Grants Program to early childhood, because as we know, 90% of our brains are developed by the time we're five years old. So good nutrition is essential for healthy brain development. And if you think about 70%, I think, of very young children in Vermont are cared for outside of the home, it's really important to focus on the nutrition security of those kids and families um, that are being served by early childhood programs. Um, and early childhood is when a children's food preferences are forming. So I'll never forget a story when I was up in Milton where they had a, a farm to school, farm to early childhood program for the preschool. And those kids, when they entered kindergarten, knew exactly how to go right up to that salad bar. They were picking things out. They were eating soup. You know, they knew right from the beginning, you know, this is what we're doing. And the parents, of course, appreciate that, right? It's much easier for the school to do it if you're a parent than to tell your kid to be eating certain things. Um, and then uh, just a couple of years ago when we passed the local foods incentive for schools, um, that really was meant to create an incentive. Um, we, our recent numbers show that schools are spending 20, over $20 million purchasing food every year. So we really want more of those dollars staying with Vermont producers and Vermont farmers. And our own goal in the legislation um, at one point, I think we could probably raise this, but was to reach 20% local purchasing. So if you think about 20% of that $20.2 million, it's significant. We also know from a UVM study that every dollar schools spend buying local, $1.60 is, uh, stays in the Vermont economy. So there's, you know, some, it's not the most lucrative market, but it's definitely an important market, and I think combined with other institutional markets. Um, and we have some folks here today that can talk more about that. We also have over 100 farms in Vermont that are selling something to schools and early childhood programs, and that's all across the state, all of your counties and, and others as well. Um, so just to go back to universal meals, we have the Farm to School Grants Program, we've got the Local Foods Incentive, and the third piece is universal meals to ensure that there's equitable access to school meals for every student in every zip code in our state, hopefully funded off the top of the education fund. So for many students, around half their daily calories come from school meals, so we know it's essential for their health and their learning and their success to have those nourishing meals. I know on School Nutrition Day, you heard from a number of school nutrition directors about um, how Universal Meals this year has really shifted participation. Um, we have Jim Birmingham here today from Montpelier District to talk more and, and about some of the other topics. But these three programs work together to integrate food access, food education, and local purchasing. So that while we provide our kids critical nutrition, they're understanding what that food does for their bodies and their communities, and they're you know, hopefully building healthy habits and connection to Vermont foods for a lifetime, all while benefiting our ag economy and our local farmers. And I think there's one quick story I would mention. Um, 
and you might have heard me say that, that in talking to some of the staff at Sodexo up at UVM, when they see Vermont kids coming through farm to school in the school system and they get to UVM, they're asking for fresh and local product. And that, to me, is really the testimony of um, this is with these kids. This is what we want every student to understand and be, you know, be connected to. So, Mr. Linda. Chair, may I ask a quick question? Sure. Thanks. Um, can you just say a little bit more about the local food grant amount? Because I, so I serve, I'm the chair of Senate Ed, and we're, we're also partnering with this committee, hoping without a doubt to keep universal meals going. One of the best parts of it is people buying from local farms. Right. It's huge. And so can you just remind us what that grant is at now? And whether or not it's time to bump it up or you know where things are at. Right. So last year there was five hundred thousand okay. dollars in the budget for local food incentive. The first that was the same as the first year. Um, the first the way the program is structured is there's a bit of an on ramp that schools can enter with a low bar and then over time they can increase their purchasing and the way they document that to receive a higher incentive for a higher percent of purchasing. The first year we were so close to 500,000, it was 490 something. Yeah. This year, my um, coworker here, mm -hmm. Helen from Nova Vermont can talk a little bit more about there is a, a dip in the amount that qualified and we can talk about and explain why that okay. happens. But we feel that um, it's the right number to continue because okay. there's a number of reasons. And I think we can't change the entire supply chain and purchasing <laughs> immediately in yep. a year. It's going to take a little bit of time. But we anticipate this will increase. And you'll Great. hear more testimony. Great. Thank you, son. That's really helpful. And we, you know, and that's why we had the, the hardwood crew in yep. and the gravel barrel crew in. Yep. Uh, because the distribution of Vermont Brown and the processing of it, we, we're trying to ramp that up as well to help uh, school staff be able to buy quantities that, you know, that they can use up before it spoils. And so Exactly. <clears throat> and we have um, representatives of two of the food hubs here today that could talk about their experience and what the impact has been. Thank you. Okay, um, so Linda, there's the, this graphic here, and I can send um, this around if you want. You've probably seen this. We call it the virtuous cycle, and um, it's showing that. Yep. Um, that. Farm to school and universal meals increases participation in school meals, which improves revenues in the program, which allows more local purchasing, which leads to more participation, and it's this positive reinforcing cycle. And the three programs that we're talking about all contribute in a positive way to that growth uh, in school meals and fresh and local food getting right into the bellies of our kids. So um, I'm happy to take questions. Let me just say that today you're going to hear from a number of us um, about the difference that Farm to School and Early Childhood has made. We can take some questions after each speaker is probably, I would suggest, a good way to do it because we're moving into house ag, some of us will leave and go to house ag. It was hard to schedule today. Usually we have a big room and a joint hearing. Yeah, we all sit in there, but yeah. we don't have any big rooms. Yeah. yeah, and my apologies, the kids aren't here to give you a taste test of their muffins and their hummus. <laughs> next year, next year that'll happen. Um, and we have a number of handouts that um, Helen can send around that just a little more background on both the impact of Farm to School and Early Childhood, the Local Foods Incentives Program is the second one, 
And um, just a couple photos, because it's always nice to make it real and say, this is what it looks like in the cafeteria. And I know Jim can uh, describe exactly what that looks like. Um, and yeah, I might just end there. I know that if there are very specific questions on Universal Meals, um, Hunger Free Vermont is here today. They're in-house ad on this topic, so they couldn't be in this room. Um, but I know we can follow up um, on the Universal Meals questions with you. So thank you once again. We're looking for your support for full funding for both the local food incentive and 500,000 base funding and the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grants Program at level funding, base funding at 500,000. And uh, as you know, the programs will support Vermont families, Vermont farmers, and Vermont children. So. Uh, is there, are there any things or anything that we can do to make life better for our Food, uh, issues that you know of or uh, yeah. um, well certainly the focus on making universal meals permanent now is is thing. the most important thing yeah. um, I think down in the future we might come back and have more discussion about nutrition security with very young children right so we've put, as you said, over many years, put in place some real system changes for the K-12 system. And I think if we can pass all of these pieces this year, we really will have changed that system. And I think, you know, future years, thinking about what about families with very young children, it's a, it's a more difficult system, um, but we're making a lot of progress. So you'll, the, the farm to school and early childhood grants have been key for getting money to early childhood providers that might um, buy some equipment for their kitchen or set up a garden or develop a relationship with a farmer. So there's pieces we're putting in place, um, but I think in the future that might be something to pay attention to. Do you have any, um, or do you know of any schools that might need uh, bigger coolers or things like that uh, to be able to keep the, their fresh uh, right. food longer? Uh, is there, are there ways that they can get help to do that? Uh, yeah, um, this morning um, we have a schedule of speakers. We're going to hear from Connor Floyd with the Vermont Agency of Education, and they've been involved with some equipment grants. Yeah. Um, also, Gina, is here from the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. They have grants that also sometimes can support equipment. So I would defer for them to answer, like, are we meeting the need? Is there still further need? Um, and we'll be able to answer that by the end of this morning a little bit better. Yeah, sounds good, Brian. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So the only thing, people keep coming to us and saying, hey, where are things with universal meals? So from, I know that the chair of ag and i have a meeting with the pro tem next week to just figure out what that path forward is so i just want people to know that it's uh we're on it you know we're on it <laughs> and yeah uh we're we're you know the chair has led on this effort for sure without a doubt from for a long long time and certainly committed to doing whatever we possibly can to twist arms and cajole and talk to our colleagues. <laughs> Thank you so much. And the evidence, like we keep hearing, is is there. Right. It's, That's right. it's incredible. So, yeah. Yeah. Where I was, that made me a little bit tardy. Um, I was talking with the chair of HealthSAC, and they have the um, Universal Meals Bill in their room. And, and so they're working on it there and then going to pass it uh, education and uh, I told them I said well you know the, the chair of Ed is is on our committee and and you know I think we're just the opposite possibly in the Senate the chair of Ed will bring it forward knowing that we'll take it up right behind him and, and 
to support himself. Um, the new chair of, of the House is, you know, he's well aware of, of the importance and, and uh, so they're plugging away. Perfect. You know, Irene, do you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know if this is directly to you or anyone else in the room, but I, someone asked me this week, what about meals for homeschoolers and people like that who are outside the public school system? Because COVID was very spoiling. Anybody under a certain age could pick up a meal at the school outside under a tent. Mm -hmm. And people are saying, whoa, now that I'm, you know, I'm not in that public school system, is there? Right. Um, yeah, can I, is that something you can answer, Jim? Mm -hmm. Maybe well, introduce who you are. So my name is Jim Birmingham. I live in Waterbury, Vermont. I'm the food service director for the Montpelier Roxbury School District. Um, the, the, there were waivers that allowed us, and, and I guess it's, as much as there were waivers, is that we were operating um, during some of that pandemic interruption. We were operating under some of the summer meal feeding programs. We were given waivers to allow us to use those rules and meal patterns to feed kids. That was how we sort of got around universal meals originally. Um, so that we could provide them. And those programs, because they're summer-based, are targeted at children, zero to 18. Now that we're back to our traditional services and are into our traditional national school breakfast and national school lunch program, those programs are aimed at kids in school. And those waivers that allowed us to use the summer meal program to feed all the kids are simply gone away. But come summer? We come come summer, um, in, in eligible communities, summer meals are free through the SFSP, the su School Food Summer Program, and the SSO Seamless Summer Option. So where there are communities, and there are communities all around the state which do do summer meals, um, those meals are free while those programs are being operated in between the school years. That's super. Thank you. Right. I totally um, um, want to be supportive of um, school meals and all of it. You know, in March, and um, I'm speaking from my afternoon committee where I sit on appropriation and I have the DCF budget that I have to look at. And in March, um, there's a, um, a major cut coming to Three Squares Vermont. And um, for those people that the 40,000 households that are under 185% of poverty, many of those families are going to be losing uh, more than $100 a month. And those are the neediest people. In, and I, as we look at all of this and we um, expand food security, we're now doing less for people that are outside schools at home school, but this neediest part of our population is is sitting there and about to take a huge cut. And I'm worried about that. Yeah, yeah thank you. It's a, it's a huge concern. And I think that's, you know, our farm to school in Vermont, um, and we're not entirely unique, but I think Definitely nationally, we have so um, integrated food access and local food together, and that's, you can't have one without the other. It doesn't make sense. And so paying attention to those families, um, removing stigma in the lunchroom so kids don't feel like they're not eating because of peer pressure or other reasons, making sure that they, um, feel safe and supported to, to be at least getting breakfast and lunch and in some schools after, you know, after school snacks and dinners even um, is, is really, it doesn't solve the problem that you raised, which is absolutely critical, but it does at least support those kids to um, you know, have a chance to learn and not be distracted by hunger. Well, it is hard for me because when I look at that DCF budget. Um, if you're a single parent, mostly single moms with two kids, um, your monthly check is you know, about $860 a month. And to lose $100 a month 
on on the food supplement on site. I don't know how people can do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Betsy, and uh, thank you, who, uh, Gina. I believe is next. Yep. Yeah. Morning. Good morning. I'm Gina Clifford. I'm with the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets. And I'm also going to distribute some materials here. This is um, our impact report um, for the Farm to School and Child Grants Program. Thank you. Very good. Good morning and welcome. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, so you, you tell us about, tell us what you do. So I manage our grants programs at the Agency of Agriculture. Um, so the grants program, as Betsy mentioned, started in 2007, and we offer annual grants to uh, schools and early child care providers and also nonprofits on an annual basis. Um, since 2007, over 200 grants have been funded. Um, $1.6 million has been invested in these farm to school and early childhood programs. Um, and as Betsy had described, the focus is on um, connecting kids to where their food comes from, um, the people who grow it, and the land that it's produced on. Um, and we also are really focused on the three C's of farm to school. So that's farm to school in the classroom, in the cafeteria, and in the community. So there are three grants programs, as I described. Um, first one is the Farm to School Early Childhood Grant, and the second is the Community Supported Agriculture Grant, or the CSA Grant, and the third is the Vision Grant. The Farm to School Early Childhood Grant is the program's flagship funding opportunity. It's been around for a long time, and you know had slight adjustments, but um, it's this capacity building grant that really focuses on both providing financial assistance, the award is an average of around $10,000 per recipient, um, as well as technical assistance. And that includes like expertise in meal program viability, local procurement, school gardens, and also um, farm to school curriculum integration. Grantees are also supported with a coach who works with them one-on-one -on -one throughout the course of their project for planning and implementation. And this has been a really a proven model within this grant program to provide schools with both financial assistance and the TA um, to really sustain and develop holistic farm to school programming across the three C's. Um, and the second grant program is the Community Supported Agriculture Grant. This is a new grant that started in 2021 and it is specifically designed for early child care and after school programs and it provides a direct reimbursement of 80% of the cost of um, purchasing a CSA or a farm share from a nearby local farm. Um, and then the programs can utilize that in their meal programming. Um, some, some provides uh, food security in terms of sending some local food home with parents with recipes. Um, so that's a really exciting, innovative program. <coughs> It's been, it's run for two years now, and we're about to open the third round of applications here this month. And then, and that's a smaller award too, I should say. The average is around $800 versus the $10,000 in the larger program. The third grant program is the Vision Grant Program, and this is also a new grant program started in 2021, and is really focused <coughs> on outside the box, um, projects and efforts that can be scaled and replicated across the state um, to really address contemporary issues in farm to school. And that grant um, so far has funded one project per year. Um, and the project this year is Fairfield Community Center Association, which there's a little spotlight on them at the end of the report. Um, and that project is focused on food sovereignty and food security and connecting students with, um, with local farmers and farm workers in dairy farms. So that's kind of the high level overview of the programs that we offer. I will say too that um, over the course of the last fiscal year, which you know closed out in June, um, we invested $190,000 across these three grant programs and provided technical assistance for the um, Farm to School and Childhood Grant Program. Um, and we 
our budget was increased as a result of legislature and Governor Scott last session. So that's fiscal year, for fiscal year 2023, we have $500,000, and we've, we are starting the process of working through that funding. So like I said, we have these three grant programs. The first one opened up in the fall, and those decisions were made in January. Um, and then we have two more grant programs, the CSA and the Vision Grant, that will open this spring. So not all 500,000 has moved out the door yet, so we can report on all of that at this point. Um, but we can definitely say that it's been really exciting to have this investment. And already so far with the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grant Program, um, twice the number of grants were funded this year over last year. Um, nine out of 14 of those grants went to early child care providers. And um, another thing that's exciting is some of those projects were put forward by um, groups of early child care providers. And so in total, uh, 48 early child care centers will engage with the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grants Program. And we still have these two other grant programs coming down the line in the spring. Um, we anticipate awarding up to 60 CSA grants this year, which is um, over twice what we supported last year. And then we're allocating $150,000 to the Vision Grant Program so we're looking to not just support one high impact innovative proposal, but several, um, and, and really look to support the holistic farm to school across the state. Um, and yes, this is a really exciting time for the Agency of Agriculture's program and for the network to have these additional resources and um, to be able to support a lot more educators to integrate these, these practices across the curriculum cafeteria. Community. And did, do you know if, um, is that in the Ag's budget this year, the 500000 In the governor's proposal, yes, yeah. it is. Keep it. <coughs> yeah, that, that always makes it a lot easier. <laughs> a lot easier. <laughs> if the governor's on board, uh, it, it really, you know, the agencies involved it it's really uh, it makes it really good because we should be all on the same page and working together and uh, i think this entire food program has worked that way pretty much and, and well that's why we're somewhat successful So are there questions for uh, Gene? Seems um, great that it's, yeah. I think the only thing that I, I just keep kind of hammering home is the more we can get, you know, <coughs> farmers connected, the better. But I completely understand what you're saying, that there's time to increase that dollar amount, and there isn't, because like what the chair said, you've got to look at these distribution centers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so but I think we're on the, the right path, and I'd be shocked if in five years, that it's not, you know, schools aren't upwards to like 60, 70 percent of their foods from local farms. But I'm, I'm a dreamer. I'm not a mess. So, any other questions? Uh, what about um, do you have anyone that helps you over there, or do you work with a group, or how's that? Yeah, so um, we have one staff person dedicated to the Farm to School program, um, but you know there's support within the division on grants management, and we have a, a grant uh, support person, Diana Ferguson, who is like our really good at you know writing grant agreements and doing a lot of that technical side of things and managing our grant system. So her and I together manage this program, and um, there's a lot of partnerships as well. So. A lot of the advising for our program actually comes from, you know, bringing up issues with all of these partners in the room, and um, um, the Agency of Ag serves on the Farm to School Early Childhood Coalition as well, um, and we get advising from them about how we can structure our grant programs better to, to meet the needs of grantees. Well, very good. Uh, thanks for yeah, a good publication. Thank you. Yeah, Thank awesome. you so much. So we have a farmer on Zoom, Ashley 
Puretti from the um, Middletown Springs Wells area. And um, Ashley, you can introduce yourself. Hey, hey. Uh, good morning. Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, for taking time to hear what I have to share with you. Um, my name is Ashley Fioretti, um, and I am from Middletown Springs, Vermont. I am the owner operator of Little Flower Farm, which is a small diversified farm raising eggs, um, produce, and making maple syrup. Um, I also have the pleasure of teaching at the Middletown Springs Elementary School and the Wells Village School. Um, and I'm a part of the Wells Springs District Farm to School team because we were fortunate enough to get one of the farm to school early childhood education grants last year. And I'm super nervous. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great. Yeah, you don't want to be nervous around this crew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I too am asking that you please support the Farm to School and Early Childhood Program with level funded base appropriation of $500,000 for the fiscal year 2024 and that you also support the local purchasing initiative program for schools at 500,000 in base funding. Um, both of these programs are really important to me, um, not only because my children attend Vermont schools, but because food in general, everything from eating it to growing it um, and food education are passions of mine. And they have been since I was a teenager. Um, I think it's really an invaluable experience for students to be able to experience local foods in a tangible manner. Um, the ability to grow food that has been served in our schools um, is one of the most fulfilling aspects of my life as a farmer. Um, without these programs, it would be a lot harder for this type of education and nutrition to take place in our local schools. And there wouldn't be such a strong connection, I think, between my farm and other local farms and our, and our schools that we're feeding. Um, through our farm to school grant, I am able to keep our school garden and the educational experiences that happen there going. Um, it's, it's really, um, it, it's hard to put a word on just the pure joy and excitement that I see watching kids get their hands in the soil to plant seeds or to transplant starts. Um, when they harvest them, that's, that pure joy is still there. And then to have them consume it in the cafeteria to feed themselves and others. It's, it's just a really special, that whole process is so special to be a part of. Um, and for students that don't have the opportunity to do that at their house or haven't been exposed to growing food before, the experience is really, it's life-changing. Um, I've been able to witness students making connections between where the food comes from and how they grow it to then feeding themselves and others. And again, it's just that that raw joy of like, oh my gosh, I did this and I saw how it happened and now I'm sharing it with you. Um, through the grant, I'm also able to teach at both of the schools, the Middletown Springs Elementary School and the Wells Village School. Um, I'm in each grade, pre-K through six, uh, once a month, um, teaching about one locally grown food. And I use um, the Harvest of the Month resource and then mobile kitchens that our grant money helped us to assemble. Um, it's really nice to be able to connect with other local farmers if I haven't grown the crop for the month. Um, and then to be able to share that with students um, and to let them know that the food that we're gonna explore using all five senses was grown either on my farm or a farm right down the road or from some other farm within our state. Um, and usually those farms are right down the road from one of the two schools, which is even more awesome. Um, I really enjoy connecting the foods to all of their classes, math, English, literature, um, science, art, and music, because I think it's, it's important for students to be exposed to food beyond what it looks like on their plate. Um, I love traveling the globe with students to talk about where a food might have originated from, um, how it got to Vermont, and the fact that other folks around the world are eating that same food at the same time, or you know that we eat that same food just so that there is that world connection um, and that food connects us all together. Um, it's fun to cook with the kids. They're all so excited. Every time I come in, they're like, what are we making this month? And what's the food crop that we're using? Um, so to know that they're having fun while learning a life skill and they're not making that connection, but I know that that's what's happening is, is really awesome. Um, <laughs> It's, there's, there's really no words to describe how great it feels when a student tries a food for the first time, especially if it's something that they started out saying, oh, I don't like that, I don't eat that. 
Um, even if they just lick it, the bravery of uh, trying something new because they feel <laughs> some pride in the fact that they helped prepare that. Um, it's, it's truly a special experience. And the bonus is when the student who didn't like it or any student asks, you know, can I get a copy of that recipe? Or a parent might approach me at a basketball game and um, tell me how much they enjoyed preparing that food with their family to share. It's not every day you get to hear that about kale chips, right? <laughs> so I just, I feel like what I'm able to do and these and what other people are able to do through these farm to school grants is just such um, an important and vital part of the learning to know about where your food comes from, how to grow it, harvest it, prepare it, why it's good for you and your bodies, you know, how it connects you to the world um, in addition to your local community. Um, so I'm really grateful that our school was able to receive one of these grants and I really hope that the program is um, gonna be able to continue to be funded. Um, and then finally, um, in regards to the, the local purchasing initiative, we are lucky enough at Middletown Springs um, that we still get to prepare our food in the cafeteria. Um, and this initiative just makes it so much easier for our, our school nutrition person to procure those foods. Um, and as a parent, knowing that there are locally sourced items on the menu makes me feel a whole lot better about my child eating school lunch. Um, we're also lucky that our cook is really adventurous. And so she'll take these local ingredients and turn them into something that is maybe not a traditional preparation, which I love because it just makes the kids more adventurous in their, in their eating. Um, so again, I'm asking you to support the Farm to School and Early Childhood Program and the, with the $500,000 and the Local Pur Purchasing Initiative Program with $500,000. I appreciate you taking time to hear what I had to say and for having me here today. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, what, uh, what grades uh, help in the garden? Are they the primary grades or? Grades, pre-K through sixth grade. Um, last year, each grade took one uh, food or family of foods that we studied um, and they were responsible for planting that. And then this school year, when the school year started, that grade then harvested the food that they, they grew. And there, we had one get together during the summer where um, numerous grades were represented. They came with their parents. Um, and so everybody got to take something home mm. to cook with at night. So it's all great, it's uh, pre-K six. It must be quite rewarding for the children to grow the food and then eat the very food they grew, uh, some different than going to the local store and getting things from who knows where. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool thing about having the parents come is that uh, some of the parents had not experienced some of the varieties that we had or didn't know, you know, oh, that's how the cherry tomatoes grow or, um, yeah, so the, the education beyond just what the kids are getting, but what they're taking home to their parents is, is that, like I say, that's the added bonus that it's, it's, it's going through the house, um, but the delivery is from the kids that are so excited about what we're doing. We miss we miss the, that generation, but the next one coming, we should have them pretty well educated, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Ashley, I'm kind of curious too. Uh, just to follow up a little bit, what what crops are you growing in at the school garden, and is there a potential that even when you involve some of the parents, they begin to grow their own garden at home? Oh, definitely. Um, so some of the crops that we grow are cherry tomatoes, slicing tomatoes, um, carrots. We grew popcorn this past year. Um, it's really fun. Um, and it was hard for so the kids were trying to see how tall they were up against the <laughs> actual stalks themselves. Um, we grow a lot of the herbs that the, the chef uses in the kitchen. Um, we grew green beans and dried beans. Um, the dried beans didn't work so well just because the weather last year was really funky. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have a pollinator garden because you know we like to talk about you know the pollinators and how important they are to the to the food that we're eating. And we grew peppers too last year because um, that was one of the foods that we talked about. Yeah. Um, 
Any other questions for Ashley? I just think the chair's comment is is right on. A lot of people my age, younger, maybe, I don't know, parents seem to have missed some of this and it really is that next generation that's picking it up, which is great and really appreciate your involvement in that. Thank you. What else, what else do you produce on your farm? Maple and veggies? Maple veggies and eggs. Occasionally we've got a pig and some meat birds, but mostly it's the eggs and the and the mixed veggies and the syrup. Yeah. Great. Any anyone down your way produce uh, local beef that goes to the program, uh, the school program or Yes, I believe that actually there's a farm just a mile down the road for me that has provided um, beef to the school. Yeah, that's really good. Um, there no other. You're welcome to stay on, uh, Ashley, and, and uh, uh, who would you like next? And Connor Floyd is with Uh, are you able to hear me all right? Yep. Yeah. That's yeah, great. Um, so yeah, I'm Connor Floyd. I'm the grant program manager for the child nutrition programs team at the Agency of Education. Um, and so my position was created in Act 67, along with the local foods incentive. In addition to managing that program, I manage all of the other uh, child nutrition grants that we operate. I do some food service management company contract oversight as well as some fiscal oversight for the program. Um, before, before getting into the local foods incentive, I did just wanna address an earlier question um, about uh, equipment needs for schools. And so we do run two grant programs, um, one which is state funded, another which is federally funded um, each year to offer uh, funds for uh, equipment needs at schools. Typically, it takes two rounds to spend the, uh, the state funding. It's a little bit of a smaller award, which I think just uh, makes it less popular with schools. Usually the federal funds um, are spent in, in one round, but so I'm sure a food service director is always gonna tell you there's always equipment needs. Um, and we provide a couple, a couple different resources for them, uh, but I'm sure Jim can, can speak more to, to those needs as well when he's up. Um, so what I'll be covering is the local foods incentive. This is the, the second year of the program being implemented, although uh, because it has that, that on-ramp year, this is essentially the, the end of the first cycle, right? Um, and so the, the baseline year is that first year that schools can apply. Uh, and there is an application, but really the application is to get the schools thinking about what they're going to need to be successful. It's it's more support versus like testing or anything like that. Um, and so every, every uh, application that's ever come in for our baseline year, we've approved, right? We might provide some technical assistance, but it's really to get schools ready. Um, and then it's in that second year moving forward, right? So after that base year, every year after that uh, is when we're asking schools to track their local purchase uh, purchases and make sure they're hitting that at least 15% local purchasing threshold. Um, and we're, we're checking those applications, we're checking their tracking tool, asking for some invoices to make sure that, you know, what they're reporting is, is accurate there. Um, as just a, you know, really quick overview of that program. So in the baseline year, schools that receive an award get 15 cents per lunch served. Uh, and then in the, in the subsequent year, uh, there's a tiered system. So 15% local purchasing will get 15 cents per lunch. Once you hit that 20% threshold, that award moves up to 20 cents per lunch. And then uh, at 25%, there's 25 cents per lunch. And currently that's the highest tier. So there's uh, three tiers there. All of this is included in the, uh, the local foods incentive legislat legislative report. Um, that was submitted back in January. Um, but just some, some more overview here. Um, let's see. Yeah. yeah, so with this year being the first year of, this, of the subsequent year applications, right, when schools needed to be tracking and submitting their, their numbers, we tried to provide a lot of support. 
uh, we ran uh, a webinar with some food service directors in Vermont feed back in the summer, kind of explaining what the process was going to be, uh, preparing schools for what applications were going to look like, what we were going to be requesting in terms of documentation. We put out um, you know, multiple guidance resources uh, on our website for schools. And we've also been working really closely with food service directors, the food hubs, uh, and nonprofit partners as we're creating this grant program and figuring out you know, exactly how's, how's it going to run on the ground, right? We want to make sure that it's something that is, uh, you know, has, has good program integrity, but is also manageable for schools. Um, food service directors are really busy. And so we recognize that and we want to try to streamline, streamline things as much as possible and ensure we're not asking for uh, unnecessary documentation or anything like that. Um, looking at this past year, I think two, two interesting points. Um, one is, uh, you know, what, what is local is always a big question, right? And so we use that Vermont local definition um, from the Agency of Agriculture. And it has three, you know, three classifications, which I'm sure you're familiar with, the raw agricultural products, the processed foods and then in the unique food category. So that's what we are using when we're talking about local. Um, there is a big question as to who's actually determining that though. And so the approach that we take is that we put that on the producer. And so either Vermont Feed will collect uh, kind of a, a letter from the producer, uh, which they post on a, a public database, or if it's a really specific product, maybe it's just one food service director buying that, you know, salsa or something. Uh, they might go directly to the producer themselves. And so that we ask that there is some letter from the producer saying, yes, this is Vermont local. It meets the definition for this reason. And that's as far as we go. Um, and that's that's the approach that we've currently been taking. It seems to be working. It, it is an extra step, right, in terms of um, an, another piece of paper. But there, there wasn't an existing structure of this is what's Vermont local and this is what isn't. And so we kind of had to create something from scratch there. Um, and then the other point is uh, just in terms of tracking tools, we did create two, uh, two templates for schools to use, two different options, uh, one using their existing accounting system and then one using an external uh, spreadsheet template uh, from Excel. We saw that um, you know, schools use both of those and there are also plenty of schools that just created their own system that worked for them. Um, so it's just interesting to kind of work through how, how each school handles things um, on their own. So looking at looking at numbers, right, and this year's results, um, we had 23 schools that were that were eligible to apply for a subsequent year award, right? So that meant last year, 23 schools applied for that baseline year and were approved, and so they were in the second year of the grant. So of those 23 schools that could have applied, um, we had uh, six that applied and qualified for a grant award, right? So those are six uh, subsequent year grantees. Uh, we had an additional nine that submitted numbers, right? They did all the tracking. Um, they knew ahead of time that they weren't going to receive the award, but they did the work. And so they submitted that data, which we always appreciate. And so we included those numbers as well. Um, and then we had eight uh, schools that apply, that were eligible to apply for a subsequent year, but decided not to, right? And so uh, presumably either they, weren't tracking from the beginning or they just saw their numbers said, hey, we're not gonna qualify. It doesn't make sense to even submit um, an application. For, for an application, uh, we just ask for them to report a few extra lines of data in a financial report, which is a document we collect from every school. So we built that application into something they're already submitting to cut down on you know applications and things that they need to be submitting to us. Uh, and we tried to keep the info request as simple as possible. Um, we had eight schools that applied for a baseline year for the first time, right? So those are schools that last year didn't engage with the program, but are feeling ready now. And so we have a larger pool next year of folks that might be trying to track local and getting to that 15% threshold. Um, the, the highest local purchasing percentage that we had this year was 27%, uh, which was Wyndham Northeast's uh, local purchasing number. That's, that's incredibly high. That's a, a really impressive number. Um, and I, I think anyone, this, this is a, a personal opinion, but I think any school that applied and hit the 15% this year has likely been doing a lot of local purchasing for years past, right? This is a really hard 
ship to move. And so folks that are getting the award right now, it means that they've been they've been doing this already. And I think as years continue to move on and schools shift their purchasing, we'll see more and more. Um, but school, yeah, a school that's doing 25% local purchasing has, has been doing that for, for a long time at this point. Um, of, of the schools that did submit uh, a subsequent year grant application, which in that they reported their local purchasing. Um, we had right around uh, $775,000 of Vermont local purchasing reported from those schools. So that's only the, what, the, uh, the 15 schools that submitted an application, but that's a pretty sizable amount of, um, you know, Vermont local food that they've, they've reported there. Um, Yes, and so for this year, we had a, um, a total funding request of just under $340,000, right? And so that is, uh, to a previous question, pretty well below that $500,000 um, program budget. Um, but now that we are into kind of tracking vocal and you know the, the, the threshold of 15% is pretty high, I think that that's a reasonable place to be. My, my assumption is that in the coming years, more schools are going to start tailoring their purchasing and we're going to see um, funding requests coming closer to bumping up against that $500,000 um, amount. And you know, hope, hopefully eventually we start exceeding that. And the question is, you know, how high does this program need to be in order to be fully funded? Um, and I think I will, Leave it there, but I'm happy to answer any any questions or dig into any details um, that folks are interested in. Yeah, uh, Senator Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Connor, what happens to the other 120 thousand? Do you keep that, or do you have to send it back, or how does that work? Good question. Um, currently, that that just um, goes back. Uh, the uh, I'm not exactly sure where, but we we don't keep it at, at the agency of education. Yeah. Yeah. So we're hoping that people do bump up against the 500, I guess, right? Because otherwise you're just sort of losing money. Uh, rolls all, it should roll. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So it doesn't roll over. It, it does not, no, it does not roll over. Um, and there have been, there was uh, similar discussions last year um, about this. And there are some, some mechanisms for other things that uh, you could do with those funds, right? We have... If you wanted to just any unused funds go to to schools, there's a we have we have funding mechanisms where you could just say, hey, any additional money gets evenly distributed amongst all the uh, schools participating in the National School Lunch Program, and that could go out to them as a payment to help their programs. Um, you know, there's yeah, there's no reason that that's what needs to happen. That's just what currently happens. Okay, thank you. Yeah, are there questions? Uh... Connor, Connor, do you uh, do you track like uh, the uh, what does the the premium that schools get? Uh, do you know what that adds up to? The, In terms uh, of like what are their grant awards? Yeah, like the fifteen cents extra a meal, or twenty cents extra a meal, or twenty five. Uh, because you had one school that should hit the the twenty five cent, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. So I can kind of so looking at that, we had two schools um, that hit that twenty five percent threshold, right? Which is the largest grant award amount at this point, and so they're both going to receive about one's one's going to receive about thirty thousand dollars in a grant award. The other one will receive a twenty seven thousand dollar grant award. Um, and that's based on their the size of their school, the number of lunches they're serving. We have another school that um, hit the 15% threshold, but serves much more meals. And so they'll receive $48,000 um, as a grant award at 15 cents per meal. So that's that's roughly, you know, I think anywhere between um, typically 15 to $40,000 is probably where most grant awards are falling at this point, um, yeah. which, which is helpful well, right, for the schools. That's good, uh, not real good. Any other questions for Connor? No? Very helpful. Uh, thank you very much, Connor. Um, yeah, thank you for your time. 
Yeah. Uh, Jim. Yep. Uh, and you're next on my list. Yep. Mine too. So, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, my name's Jim Birmingham. I live in Waterbury, Vermont. I am the food service director for the Montpelier Roxbury School District. Um, and I'm going to read you my testimony today. I, what my goal is to try to draw connections between uh, the, the funds that you are able to allocate to farm to school and the way that we're able to see a direct benefit um, in us spending those dollars uh, with Vermont farmers. So thank you uh, for supporting universal free school meals for Vermont students this year. Uh, the benefits of universal meals are numerous and have led to a marked increase in the school, particip school meal participation in our district. This increase in participation has led to a corresponding increase in the amount of food that we are buying, and this increase represents an opportunity for, for farmers and producers who could benefit from supplying Vermont school meal programs. In this school year, Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools have already purchased roughly $20,000 worth of fruits and vegetables, cheese, bread, maple syrups, and meat uh, from Vermont farms and producers. Presently, we're working on soliciting bids from Vermont farms and producers for the products we will need to procure for next school year. For example, we're evaluating bids to procure 80 gallons of uh, maple syrup uh, for our cafeteria uh, and 500 pounds of Vermont brown beef. This is you know, looking ahead to the 23-24 school year. My understanding um, and application of the procurement regulations and the informal bid process that we need to go through uh, in order to make these connections with Vermont farmers and buy these foods and bring them into our cafeterias, that understanding is a direct result of training that I received from the Vermont Farm to School community. Uh, that training has been largely supported by grants funded by the Agency of Agriculture. And so this represents a clear example of the benefits of funding farm to school initiatives. Montpelier Roxbury will be spending more money with Vermont producers as a direct result of the training supported by the grant, by the, these grant funds. So for the benefit of Vermont students and food producers, please continue to support the farm to school and early childhood programs with the level funded base appropriation of $500,000 for the fiscal year 2024. The local foods incentive grant available to Vermont school food authorities has created a major shift in the way that school food directors think about spending and think about spending money and also utilizing their USDA commodity foods entitlements. I think it's important to note that school food directors have for many years focused their menu, their production, and their purchasing plans on maximizing their use of those USDA commodity foods in order to reduce their food costs. The introduction of the local incentive grant has rapidly changed that mindset among food service directors. Now we're prioritizing local purchases that count towards the local incentive grant over USDA commodity foods. Whether food is available locally has become a much greater factor for food service directors when deciding how to allocate USDA entitlement funds as a direct result of the local incentive grant. This shift has not been an easy one. Changing the purchasing paradigm takes time for school food authorities who make decisions on bids with local producers and USDA food allocations far in advance. Remember, right now, I'm working on next year's allocations. Our district was unsuccessful in our first attempt at reaching the local purchasing threshold for the grant award. Uh, we are continuing our efforts to increase our local purchases with the goal of successfully reaching the 15% threshold for local purchases in the future. An idea I have is for in future iterations of the local incentive grant, it could be a benefit for a partial award to be allocated if there are still grant funds available, which we just talked about with Connor. What can we do with that, the balance of funds? If a district like mine had tried to meet that threshold but fallen short, if their funds were left, I think that it would be a benefit to a district like mine to be able to receive a partial award. Say if we'd gotten to 12%, maybe we could receive 12 cents per meal if the funding allowed. I think that that would encourage districts who are wary of trying to achieve their, that 15%. I think the people are maybe wary of even trying for, feel of, for fear of falling short, and I think that 
using uh, any fund balance in that grant uh, in that way might, you know, spur people on if they could take a chance and try to get to that 15%. While not within the purview of this committee, I do want to take this opportunity to, to say that one major shift that I think could create a major benefit for Vermont farmers and producers would be to move from the current system of USDA commodity foods entitlements to providing cash in lieu of commodities. Providing SFAs with their USDA entitlement as cash would allow SFAs to spend those funds with Vermont producers. Vermont food service directors are looking for ways to reduce our dependence on USDA foods and maximize our use of the local incentive grant. This is a major paradigm shift that's been readily accepted by a group that has been historically wary of change. Having the opportunity to receive cash in lieu of commodities would keep much of those funds in Vermont. Presently, nearly all of the USDA funds awarded to Vermont schools go to out-of-state producers. The local food incentive grant has had a deep and immediate impact on many Vermont school food authorities. Our efforts to reimagine school food purchasing to maximize local purchases are ongoing. What is clear is that the local foods incentive grant is working and that more and more school food dollars are being spent in Vermont as a direct result of it. So I ask for the benefit of Vermont students and food producers, please support the local purchasing incentive program for schools at $500,000 in base math funding. Thank you. <coughs> Well, uh, <laughs> that was sorry. Um, well done. <laughs> the uh, the last issue you brought the the first issue you brought up about money being left on the table. Yeah, that's a good idea. And mm -hmm. I I don't know why we haven't done that, but um, you know if it if it just gets turned back in. Uh, to the general fund, then we reauthorize it again. Uh, it'd be better to use that money up and, and give those uh, districts that, you know, got a leg up, but they just missed it by a little, a little incentive to work harder to, to get the full amount. The, uh, uh, the issue of swapping out yeah cash for commodity products, I doubt if we'd have anything to do with that because it's given, you know, there's so much of it that's just given to Vermont and so I don't know about that. I, I understand that. I thought that, you know, it's an idea that um, is popular among food service directors. I'm part of a, a, a statewide USDA Foods Advisory Group, which is a group of food service directors. And that's the way we would love to receive that money. And while I understand that it's not this committee's, you know, doesn't have the ability to change that, it's an opportunity for me to speak publicly about it and at the very least make you guys aware that it's something that we'd love to see. Uh, Senator Welch is on the uh, U.S. Uh, Ag Committee, so it's something like it, we, it, it would be a connection yeah, there. May, may I, may, it, <clears throat> put it out there as an issue at the very, yep. the very worst we could make some noise. Yeah. And, you know, if we... I mean that a lot of that federal commodities food uh, isn't that loaded down with uh, uh, preservatives or salt or I'll, I'll say that we would prefer the quality of Vermont made products as opposed to the variable quality that we sometimes run into with commodity programs, which are domestic pro domestic products, but they're not of the quality that we you know associate with Vermont. Yeah. And do you get choices on, can you kind of pick out what you want or? Does With the USDA Foods Entitlements, we are given, basically we're given a dollar amount and then we're given a catalog of products that we're able to order from to use those, use those entitlement dollars. Um, and like, it's, I think it's important to note that that's a process that's happening now for next school year. So it's something that happens far in advance where we're allocating those USDA food dollars. <clears throat> the other issue that <clears throat> has come up, uh, not today, but in previous meetings, is that uh, schools are 
having a harder time getting parents to fill out their income qualification uh, papers so that we can get the, maximize our federal hot lunch money. But how how's that working at your schools? We absolutely collected a lot less applications this year than we did in years past. Um, you know, in in years past, it's tough to, to speak to the specific numbers, but I would approve, you know, northwards of 100 um, applications, and we would have, you know, a handful that were denied for being over. This year, I think that I only approved 30, uh, you know, so maybe only 30% of what had been, but, and I think that that's a direct result of people not feeling like they need to in order to get their free meal, which I don't, you know, we're operating in that provision two base year um, in our district, and so we, we encourage applications, um, and I got a lot of applications from students, you know, families in kindergarten, and I, I denied a lot of applications that were over the limit, which tells me that the message was out, you know, the message was getting out to families to please submit these applications, because the, the families knew the district were. Um, but ultimately, we've approved dramatically less applications for free meals than we have in previous years. See, and um, what happens with, of course, if you don't, if you don't get them, then Rosie or the ed agency doesn't get them. And what it does is it shifts all the costs from the feds onto us. And uh, somehow we've got to figure out a way to entice parents to, you know, fill those out. I, I don't, do you have to, what do you have to put on one of those applications? You know, there's the demographic information, your name and address, phone number, the number of um, residents, you know, how many people live in your household, uh, and what is your household income. And, and that's really, that's it. Um, and then, you know, we, we approve it, you know, based on where the, or, or deny it, you know, based on the income limit. Um, so it's not that it's an arduous process. I think that it's just something that people are able to skip. And so they do. And I think it's a slide that we've been on for a few years now as eligibility is carried over and carried over from the 2019 school year yeah. all the way until October of 2022, people were able to stay with that eligibility without having to fill out a new, new application. You know, beginning of October, all of those, those grandfathered applications expired, and now we're ready to collect new ones, but people are getting their free meals anyway, so I think that's sort of yeah. the process. Yeah, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Jim, how do you let the parents know? The parents are notified, you know, it's part of our regulations of how we do it. Parents are notified at the beginning of the school year, we, you know, they get a, a, a in the packet of information that they get for the beginning of the school year is what we call the invitation and instructions, which explains what the school meal programs are and that they're available. It includes an application um, and also uh, includes the instructions to fill out that application. Um, you know, we also offer electronic applications as an option in our district, which is not something that every district does, but we're doing what we can to try to make it easier for folks. Um, but I think that they just kind of don't feel motivated because the school meals are free. And so, yeah, I think that we're missing some of that information. And I think that the, the, we're, the state of Vermont is paying for more meals than they would if we were using those app, those eligibilities. So that's dependent on the kids themselves bringing that packet home, or is it? No, mail? that comes, usually I get those directly from parents. You know, they, they, at the beginning of school year, they're, they come into school and get turned into teachers, and I get big packets of them. Um, and then I also get them mailed to me and scanned to me, and they, they come through any, any way that a, they can, a family can get them to me, um, they do. And it's not, relying on the student. It's communication that's happening with the families um, about getting those applications in. Uh, Irene? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when those parents get that form, what is the cover letter? Does it say this is for people who want free meals or are eligible for meals? Or does it say save the state of Vermont money to help us draw more federal funds. I mean, can we can we pitch it in a way that people feel more motivated and more patriotic about it than just 
tugging it to an income level because I think that message may be getting lost if it's, if you're not already using it. I think that the food service directors and the people in this room are aware of that. You know, nobody else understands how <laughs> those meals are being paid for. Right. But and so, and so, that. yeah. And so, that, the that's, absolutely. I think that the invitation and instructions that we get as a template from the agency of education um, could absolutely be modified to, to to explain why it is we're still collecting <laughs> these applications. I think that the letter now tries to highlight some of the personal ben personal benefits. You know, reduce costs of Wi-Fi or, or you know, internet or college application fees and some of those things, but, I, but potentially I think that that's something to consider that there's other motivations for filling that application out too and saving the state money might might be one that people listen to. So I think that's a, that is absolutely a, uh, an opportunity. Um, like I say we that's a template that comes annually from the agency of education. So we we can talk with uh, Rosie or somebody over at the agency about maybe even bringing us a copy of that yep. uh, request um, because if, if we don't get that reimbursement from the feds it's all it does is it drives our property tax right. to right. cover that bill and you know I think we're okay this year but down the road People are going to start, you know, our, our buddies are going to start saying, well, you guys got this program going and now we aren't drawing this federal money because you didn't upgrade your requests from parents in a proper manner. Or, and um, so it, we've got to figure that one out because um, that's the only downside I've heard of any uh, shape uh, to the universal meals yeah, program. The cost that's gonna be, yeah. And you know, you're not alone. I think it's it's across the whole the whole state. I can only imagine for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, any other questions for Jim? No. Nope. No. Thank you for your well, time. Well Good thank job. you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Oh, I wanted to ask you too. Um, how much? How many extra meals have you had to put out? I I would say that our meals served is up somewhere between fifteen and twenty percent. Um, it's hard to really um, know for sure because it's been so long since we had a normal year with the pandemic interruption. But um, I, from what we were doing. Right. Pre-pandemic to the meals that we're serving now, that are they're up fifteen to twenty percent. Yeah, and what we heard is sixteen percent. So you're in the range. Yeah, we're right there. You know, um, it depends on if it's a popular meal or not. Today, twenty <laughs> percent. <laughs> they like pizza. <laughs> is that still Fridays? Yes. Well, <laughs> something that's never changed. Something yeah. never well, changed. Well, that's that's right. really contradicting me. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Yeah, I remember. Is it Monday? I don't know. I haven't been to school in six weeks. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jim. Yes. Uh, Becca? Hello. Morning. Hello. Welcome. Morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. My name is Becca Perrin. I'm the account manager for Green Mountain Farm Direct. We're a local nonprofit food hub based in Newport, Vermont. Um, I'm one of two local nonprofit food hubs we're going to hear from today. I love one representative is Tom. Um, so we're sort of the intermediary between the schools and the farms themselves. So schools want to start purchasing local and not sure where to start or feel overwhelmed by the prospect of finding all these different farms to procure from. We make it an easy one-stop shop. Um, folks can order online from our ordering platform, put it in a cart, and then could get delivered within a week. Um, so we work with the farm, the Vermont-based farmers and food producers, and then we work with the schools to develop what they need from us and from the farms and provide technical assistance and marketing services. So I'm going to speak about the local purchasing incentive that Connor introduced and Jim spoke about um, and how that's affected our work and how we've seen that support both farmers and the schools that we work with. 
So I'm going to ask you to please support the Farm School and Early Childhood Program with a level funded base appropriation of $500,000 for fiscal year 2024. Also, please support the local purchasing incentive program for schools at $500,000 in base funding. Green Mountain Farm Direct, also known as Farm Direct, is a regional mission-driven food hub that partners with Vermont-based farmers and producers to provide affordable, bulk local food to schools, institutions, and retailers across northern and central Vermont. So we would like to say that our distribution location is if you carve a line, east to west across Montpelier, we're north of there. That's where we distribute broadly. Um, we currently- Route to north. Route to north, exactly. Yeah. Um, we currently regularly service 72 school accounts across 18 supervisory unions and five private schools and early childhood education centers. Farm Direct operates as an aggregation and distribution service, as well as providing marketing, sales, and technical assistance to our producer and customer partners. Every dollar that passes through Farm Direct supports Vermont's food businesses, provides Vermonters with fresh locally produced food, and strengthens the connections within our local food economy. Farm to school programming and the local purchasing incentive help create a stable food system that includes schools and early childhood education centers. When the local purchasing incentive program was launched at the start of the 2021-2022 school year, schools, like all of us, were reeling from the COVID-19 pandemic. Farm Direct saw its sales from schools plummet dramatically during the 2020 to 2021 school year, a year that, that forced schools to pivot to to-go meals and forgo scratch cooking, which changed their procurement needs. The local purchasing incentive program felt like a lifeline, empowering supervisory unions to reinforce their budgets and reduce the local <coughs> purchasing. In the Northeast Kingdom, many schools are rural with enrollments under 100 and tiny procurement budgets for their kitchens. Given these barriers, local purchasing is often a challenge, but the local purchasing incentive is a direct response to that challenge. When Caledonia Central Supervisory Union applied for a baseline year funding and received from funds from the local purchasing incentive program in spring 2022, Farm Direct saw them bounce, bounce back better than ever into local procurement. They were able to work with Farm Direct to reinvest in their priority of purchasing local products and establish regular deliveries to their seven rurally based schools. As a result, Farm Direct sales of Vermont produced and grown food to Caledonia Central Schools more than tripled in the 2021 to 2022 school year from the previous year. The seven Caledonia Central Schools were all empowered to participate in our regular Harvest of the Month delivery program, which sends seasonal items to schools on a monthly basis for their use in menus and educational farm to school programming. We also saw the food service director for Cabot School, which has an enrollment of 158 students, increase their regular purchasing of locally raised ground beef from beloved NEK meat producer Bro Slaughterhouse in Troy, locally grown and stone ground wheat flour from Morningstar Farms in Glover, and carrots from Pete's Greens in Craftsbury. Serving local products in school cafeterias creates ample opportunities for connection between students and their local food system as well as expanding their understanding of where food comes from. It also opens up new wholesale markets for our local producers who can rely on Farm Direct for technical assistance with their sales. Green Mountain Farm Direct saw its overall sales to school customers grow by 25% between the 2020 to 2021 and 2021 to 2022 school years. All 52 of our Vermont-based farmers and food producers were directly benefited by the sales increase but it was especially impactful to our small scale vegetable growers like Joe, Joesbrook Farm in St. Johnsbury, whose, schools, whose sales to schools more than tripled in that time period, Hartwood Farm in South Albany, whose school sales quadrupled, and West Farm in Jeffersonville, whose school sales also quadrupled. We know that these meaningful increases were directly supported by the local purchasing incentive program, which empowered schools to reinvest their budgets in the local food economy. So again, I ask you to please support the Farm to School and Early Childhood Program and the Local Purchasing Incentive Program. These programs are critical to the ability for schools and early childhood programs to participate in and strengthen our local food system and create a sustainable food economy for all Vermonters. <coughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, the, uh, uh, do you find, uh, do you deal with anything 
in the bidding or in the cost of local foods versus off the truck from California foods? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I'm wondering, how do our local foods compare in cost, would you say? That's a really good question. That's the biggest barrier we deal with is competing with the costs of foods that are trucked from California. Um, and the purchasing incentive is a huge help with that because it's easier in every, almost every sense for a food service director who's already overwhelmed with everything else they have to deal with to just pick order from Reinhardt, which is the big distributor um, that just bring, they have a huge catalog, the prices are great, it agrees with their budget, they just choose that and it gets on the truck. Um, so we compete with that, with yeah. this, these grants, and we're supported by them, and we also like to provide, we're a tiny like, service, so we like to provide really good customer service and technical assistance if they need it, um, whereas big companies like Reinhardt can't really do that. So we, and then we also like to work with our producers to support them in offering products to schools. So a lot of times our producers will offer um, a different product, maybe like a seconds product, um, that or like a kitchen grade box of carrots. They wouldn't sell retail, they'll sell that to schools. Still an amazing locally grown box of carrots, but maybe they're funny shapes or like, you know, off sizes. Um, so then they'll be able to offer those to schools at a lower price and it works for everyone and we see those carrots not go to waste. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> they, uh... Yeah, you mentioned like Browse and do, now do they operate through the Vermont Connecting Heart? Is that hardware? Where? Those are that's our, our trucking partner actually. So food, yeah. food connect farm farm connects. Farm. Um, C A E farm connects um, does all our trucking. It's so hard to keep them all. <laughs> yeah, I know. I still do it. Still do it. Well, it mix it all up. So we had. Um, we had them in yep. a week or week and a half oh, ago, did you? and good. they were explaining, you know, a half a dozen vehicles or whatever, you know, going and keeping them from meeting each other or overlapping yep. each other's, mm -hmm. you know, it's quite a little job mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to do that, and, uh, but uh, they, um, they do quite a lot of processing there as well. Like you could bring your care to say, have them all diced and bagged and ready to go. But yeah, Just Cut is their program that does the lightly processed yeah. root vegetables. Um, yeah, we work with them, we distribute their, their products. And uh, as well. do they pick up like bros meat and deliver it at the different schools? Exactly. When when yeah. it needs to be picked up. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm just thinking to myself here, wondering aloud, I guess, would be a, mm -hmm. another way to say it. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned the, the farmer, which is just a suggestion maybe with the packet that goes out that Jim had talked about. I would think if a farmer actually wrote a one sheet that explained how he or she would be benefited from an increase in the, in the uh, filling out of those forms and include that with somehow, to me, that would, you would see an increase, I think, in, in the number of families that are filling that out, which would offset the increase in property taxes, as our chair mentioned. It's just, I mean, the idea is to get as many eligible people to fill it out as possible. And to me, if you could make it more personal than just here's another form from the Agency of Education with all due respect to them, um, you know, it's Farmer Jim and, and I live down the road. Right. Maybe we could, I like that. I like that idea. we could put that right at the bottom of the letter or at the top of the letter, help your local uh, yeah. farmer um, Fill that out. eat local and, and yeah. then <clears throat> maybe show a little flow chart. You know, <laughs> you fill out the form, and some of this money comes from the feds to feed. And put a picture of the farm or the farmer on it. <laughs> oh, yeah, we like to do that. Perfect graphics. We'll have, um, we are, or Brian will yeah. have Rosie in from uh, the agency, and we'll try to 
figure that out because it, we're, we're going to hear about that eventually <laughs> from our colleagues. Well, you've got to get more people to sign anything. Um, yeah, it's all that. Well, we're sick and tired of feeding those old rich kids. You know, you know, start naming them. Um, <laughs> and not many of them. Um, Maybe I shouldn't have suggested that. <laughs> um, any other questions? Um, Oh, good job. Thank thanks, you. Well, thank you, and thanks Thank you for coming so down. Pretty good drive from Newport. Oh, well, I live in Johnson. So oh, wow. Well, oh, you, <laughs> you only had to go halfway then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> morning, Tom. Good morning. Yeah. I'm Tom Bruggen, and I work at Food Connects, where a nonprofit that offers farm to school coaching services in southern Vermont as well as distributing 100% source identified food to more than 60 schools throughout Vermont, New Hampshire, and Western Mass. As the you out of Brattleboro? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Good to have you with me. You had a trip. Fortunately, I was in South Burlington, so it wasn't too bad, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Today, I ask that you please support the Farm to School and Early Childhood Program with a level-funded base appropriation of 500000 for fiscal year 2024, as well as the Local Food Center Grant, or LFI, at 500000 in base funding. In support of this request, I'm here today to share a few stories of Vermont farms and producers that have benefited from the Local Food Center Grant. Quick background, Food Connects operates a food hub that delivers 100% source-identified foods to wholesale customers throughout Vermont, New Hampshire, and Western Mass. And in my role as institutional sales associate, I have the privilege of overseeing our Vermont public school accounts and supporting them with their purchasing. Every week, I talk with food service professionals about products Food Connects offers that meet the Vermont definition of local for the LFI. The first producer story to share highlights Boyden Farm. Food Connects started selling Boyden Farm beef in March 2021. Located in Cambridge, Vermont, Boyden Farm is a fifth generation family farm that offers grass fed, grain finished beef. Farmer Mark Boyden cares deeply about serving public schools. He says the big thing is getting kids to expect local food, and they keep that when they grow up. That's more important than sales. The next school year, 2021 and 2022, Food Connect sold approximately $35,000 of Boyden Farm beef to Vermont public schools. Two districts were responsible for more than 45% of these orders. Wyndham Northeast Supervisory Union and Windsor Central Supervisory Union. Of the districts that reapplied for the LFI, these districts have the two highest local purchasing percentages. Prior to the LFI, it was really difficult to sell Vermont local proteins to public schools, primarily due to food service budgetary constraints. Now that schools have a financial incentive to source Vermont products, this barrier to entry has been greatly reduced. In fact, one of the easiest ways for Vermont public schools to increase their local purchasing is by sourcing Vermont center of the plate proteins, like ground beef and patties. Another Vermont farm to highlight is Green Orchards, located in Putney, Vermont. Four generations of the Dara family have farmed the hills that make up Green Orchards. This orchard was one of Food Connect's first partnering farms over a decade ago, so it's been especially rewarding to, to support the orchard's increased sales as, as a result of the health pie. Food Connect sold only $9,000 in apple sales in Vermont public schools in school year 2020 to 2021, and then approximately $48,500 in apple sales in the following school year. This represents a 400% increase. What were those years in 2022? 2020 to 2021, um, 9,000, and then 2021 to 2022. And so 2021 to 2022 was really when the SFAs had the chance to be aware of this yeah. incentive and start ramping up uh, their sourcing. So that's a 40% increase. With COVID, I assume they do that too. Yes. Yeah. So as Becca mentioned, prior, like when when COVID you know, hit, there's an added effort uh, to source local food, and so food service directors had to you know, resort to just really prioritizing what needed to be done, and so often that meant reducing. Yeah. Other avenues of sourcing, including local What was Thanks. the increase in sales? The four hundred percent. Yeah, so it's huge. Yeah, that's a good, good boost. Yeah. 
and we've already exceeded 50,000 in Apple sales this school year, and it's only February. Wow. Andre Dara, owner of Green Mountain Orchards, is excited to sell more to Vermont schools, especially since Food Connect pays a fair market price compared to our other customer outlets. And Andre and I are already in the planning stages to deliver more Green Mountain Orchard apples to Vermont public schools for next year's harvest. Our hope is that at some point, every apple in a Vermont school comes from a Vermont orchard. Yeah, yeah we don't need to truck them from Washington. It's not needed. No. No. We have it's here. Crazy. Yeah. Um, Just think of uh, the dollars we save, or somebody saves on that diesel fuel that exactly. we can truck yeah. the greenhouse gas across the country. <laughs> yeah. So providing the requested funding for the LFI will help us get to this, this mission. While there are many more to choose from, the last producer story I'll highlight today is of True North Granola founders Ingrid and Franklin Crisco. Based out of Brattleboro, Vermont, Ingrid and Franklin are lifelong educators and recognize the importance of healthy foods in schools. Because of the LFI, Wyndham Southeast SU began purchasing their gluten-free, no-nuts maple vanilla granola. While Food Connects only sold $30 of True North Granola to all Vermont public schools in school year 2020 to 2021, we sold more than 7,000 in the following school year. I can continue to share more stories demonstrating the beneficial social and economic impacts of the LFI from purchasing new products from our existing producer base, like Vermont Salumi Bulk Sausage, to onboarding new producers all together, including Cabot. I've seen firsthand how the LFI continues to strengthen the local food economy. By supporting the local food incentive grant, the $500,000 in base funding, you have the opportunity to ensure that our children have access to a diversified range of local, nutritious foods while providing a sustainable market for our Vermont farmers. From our farmers to our children, the LFI is a win-win. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. You said $30 to $9,000? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite a jump. And that's well, and then, 47%. Yeah. <laughs> and it just goes to show that, like, so process granola uh, before the incentive, it just, like, had, it was at a price threshold that was just yeah. manageable for for schools, but then they saw it in a different light. Yeah, well, and, and of course, to sell all those apples somewhere rather than home, yeah. you've got to be transported out of here. And, you know, that costs money. Well, yeah. And, uh, Fossil but, fuels. Yeah. And uh, so it, it uh, the benefits, the true benefits, have never been really measured. On, you know, the difference in buying uh, from Reinhardt or local, you know, there's a spread there where you can get it cheaper from yeah. Reinhardt. But the additional cost of the roads and the wear and tear mm -hmm. and, and, and taking money from Vermonters, exporting it out of state instead of keeping it here and rotating between us. Um, you know, if you figured all that in, um, I bet it's way cheaper to buy our yeah. local food. And you, we know what we're getting. Exactly. Um, yeah. You know, talking about apples, uh, you said Daryl's still on that? Andrea Daryl. Daryl. Uh, yeah, the Daryl family. Yeah, uh, Steve Daryl uh, used to be here in the in the legislature with oh, us and uh, in a senior year, I don't recall his name, the father, he was a commissioner of ag for Oh, really? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that family goes back a long, a long way. A so. long way. And uh, the, uh, so, um, the, uh, but you ought to get your beef from Rose Market. <laughs> I wonder where they are. <laughs> uh, now, Boyden's, uh, they're doing a great job up there with, uh, you know. I personally approve of Boyden. <laughs> uh, and of course, I was certainly joking on it. As long as it's Vermont grown, I don't yeah. buy it anywhere. So, uh, the, uh, so you, you service a lot of schools then? Yeah, so over 60 schools throughout Vermont, New Hampshire, Western Mass, and, uh, yeah. and 
than a lot of other retail and other wholesale accounts as well. Now, are these two other states are, I don't know where they're located. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have any uh, type of a local uh, drum in New, system in their schools? In New Hampshire, it's up for for discussion with the, the, the legislature, legislature right now. Yes. Huh. Um, and a similar type of model um, incentivizing local purchasing yeah. to help that all get approved. And, and you folks also work with the crew in Rutland some? Yeah, the VFFC, uh, Vermont yeah. Farm yeah. Food Center, yes. Yeah, so the really the Vermont Food Hubs, um, all we all inter interconnect and we try to support you know our common goal yeah. Um, who do we have in? Do we have someone in from the Bramble Girl? Uh, 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 yeah, we did. Richard? Richard Brookfield? I don't remember. Uh, but the, you know, the distribution of our Vermont products is key to making this yeah. all work in a, in a smooth uh, way for our hot lunch people. Uh, because if they can't get the food, they're going to pick the phone up. You know, they got to have the food. And uh, so that uh, it's good that you folks are doing your share. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Oh, thanks, uh, Tom. That's thank good. You. Oh, sure. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you for being with us. And, Helen. All right. You've been waiting. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm here to bring up the rear, um, and I'm very happy to do so. Thank you so much for, for having all of us here with you this morning. It's been wonderful to listen to these conversations and just reflect on the really significant impact um, of both the grants program and the local foods incentive. Um, so for the record, my name is Helen Rortvet, and I am the Farm to School and Food Access Programs Director at NOFA Vermont. Uh, and together with Betsy Rosenbluth, who we heard from earlier this morning, I co-lead the Vermont Feed Project. Um, so I want to share just a little bit more, just to drive home the point, um, about why this local foods incentive grant program is so important and why it shows us, is why it's showing so much promise. Um, as Betsy mentioned earlier today, schools in Vermont spent approximately $20 million on food last school year. Uh, to provide approximately 17 million meals to Vermont kids. So that math is relatively simple, although I'm not going to do it in my head immediately in front of you, but it's pretty close to a little more than a dollar per meal. Um, school nutrition professionals have been telling us for years that they want to buy more local foods. And you heard from Jim that this has been you know, a goal, and some schools have been working on it for years and years, and others have felt constrained. Um, but with little more than a dollar to spend per plate, they lacked sufficient funds to do so on a more meaningful scale. So this local foods incentive provides school nutrition programs with much needed financial resources. And what's more, it really encourages them to put Vermont farmers and producers first when making decisions, like you've heard from, from Jim and some stories from our Food Hub partners already. Um, now, in just the second year of the Local Foods Incentive Program, 31 of Vermont's 51 SFAs, school food authorities, have participated, either through that on-ramp baseline year, um, which is a supported year to kind of get your systems in order, um, or by applying for that subsequent year grant where you are required to submit your, your tracking and document your local purchases. Um, so that's 60% of the SFAs in the state already, just in year two. Uh, which feels pretty good. <laughs> um, we have identified a variety of local products that schools are buying. You've heard from uh, our Food Hub partners about the range of products from dairy to meat and poultry, maple, baked products, um, and more. So this is positively affecting all kinds of Vermont producers. It's not just one type of producer uh, that's taking the whole slice of the pie here. Um, the SFAs that were successful in achieving uh, at least the 15% threshold and those that applied but didn't quite get there together, they spent over $775,000 on Vermont local foods last year, 
Um, and that's actually more than double the $340,000 we'll be giving out in grant awards through this program this year. So um, that's a pretty remarkable two to one early return on this investment. Um, and I think we'll just see those numbers continue to grow into the future. Um, Act 67 of 2021, which established the Local Foods Incentive Grant Program, states that it is the goal of the state that by the year 2023, which I think we're in right now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, at least 20% of the food schools purchased will be locally produced. And while we're not quite there yet, we're still working out some tracking mechanisms um, and certainly supply chain shifts, um, we've made really significant strides forward in relatively short order. Um, and as uh, Jim and others have spoken to, the institutional supply chain does take time to respond. You can't just flip a switch here. Um, it takes time for school nutrition programs to set up new purchasing relationships and tracking systems. Um, and yet we see the relatively high participation rate in those base layer, baseline year grants and the notable number of SFAs that uh, went so far as to submit their subsequent year application but fell a little bit short. Um, as a really clear expression of demand and support for this and need for this program among schools. On the demand side, my colleagues, I want to really lift up and shout out Kayla Strom here. She has been a, a real, real asset in this respect. Um, we've been providing a lot of support and technical assistance um, as NOFA and Vermont feed um, directly to schools that are wanting help, needing help navigating the ins and outs of the program. Um, support connecting to local producers, um, et cetera. And then also on the supply side, we've been working with those local producers, connecting with our friends in the food hubs and distributors to improve schools' access to and awareness of those local foods. Um, so the Local Foods Incentive has already proven to be a really powerful tool in catalyzing a shift towards purchasing more Vermont schools. I'm confident that within a few years, we'll see at least 15% local purchasing become more the norm than the outlier in Vermont schools. So to scale back a little bit and focus on the even bigger picture for, them for the moment, if, if you will, um, school meals programs are really growing the next generation of consumers. Kids who are growing up in Vermont schools with strong farm to school programs, as you heard earlier from Betsy, are showing up at UVM asking for and demanding local food in the cafeterias there. Um, and as schools continue to increase their local purchasing, we'll see the further strengthening of our local supply chain, which will facilitate greater market opportunities for our farmers and producers. The local foods incentive clearly illustrates the power of a state incentive to catalyze these shifts in institutional purchasing practices. <clears throat> <Pardon me. laughs> so we're all here together, including, including this committee, working to push back against a system, frankly, that privileges large-scale agriculture that far too often depletes soil health, exacerbates the climate crisis, and concentrates wealth in the hands of a few landowners. This local foods incentive helps our schools to shift the focus back towards supporting our small and medium-sized producers right here in Vermont. This program is a really big step forward toward leveling the playing field in school food purchasing. So to wrap everything up, uh, as I'm your last speaker on the docket for the day, we made it. Uh, you've heard from a variety of stakeholders about the myriad positive impacts of the various investments that the legislature has made in farm to school and early childhood programs over the years. The grants program, which we heard about uh, from Gina and Betsy earlier and Ashley, uh, through its innovative blend of financial support to schools, expert and focused technical assistance, and the support of a coach helps to build strong farm to school programs with real staying power. Um, and as we've been discussing recently, the Local Foods Incentive Grant Program is already transforming the way that school nutrition programs think about their food purchasing, shifting more dollars towards Vermont farmers and producers. We anticipate this shift will only continue to grow in the coming years. So thank you for the investments you've already made in farm to school and early childhood programs. Thank you also to our colleagues at the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets and the Agency of Education for their strong partnership and leadership in ensuring the success of these programs. Um, and as a reminder, we have come here together today to ask for your support for the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grants Program with a level funded base appropriation of $500,000 for fiscal year 2024 um, and to support the local purchasing incentive program 
uh, at $500,000 in base funding. So in case you hadn't heard that floating around the room, I just wanted to make sure. Um, thank you. Yeah. 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 Good, good reminder. Yeah. Thank you very much. Two, two, five. What? Oh my God. Five hundred. Five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a couple zeros. Not a couple zeros. Oh, and Kayla reminded me to um, pitch the lunch menu today. So we've been working with our friends at the Abbey Group up at the cafeteria, uh -huh. oh. and they are featuring um, a local lunch option. It's um, a recipe that comes from our New School Cuisine Cookbook, which is a cookbook that was written by and for Vermont school nutrition professionals that features local products. Um, so there is a quinoa, black bean, roasted butternut squash, and local chicken um, option on the yeah. menu at lunch today. So wow. I recommend you check that out. That sounds yeah, great. I'll be up there. I might need to. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to have online. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So, how do you take any questions? Yeah, uh, thank you, Helen. Uh, there are questions. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Chair. You mentioned dairy. I don't tend to think of yeah. a lot of local dairy in school cafeterias or institutions. Yeah. Is local milk actually getting at local yogurt and things? Is yeah. Local cheese getting in sufficiently? So, fantastic. Can we work on that? Somewhere? Fantastic question. And there's a couple of layers to, to, to the response. Um, there are a lot of local dairy products in schools. In particular, yogurt and cheese are very, very prevalent. Um, Tom spoke earlier about uh, establishing a relationship with, with Cabot. A lot of schools are buying uh, a lot of Cabot products as they count towards the local foods incentive. Um, and some of the other um, dairy producers as well, Green Mountain Creamery down in Brattleboro sells a lot of yogurt to schools. We even have schools buying Butterworks yogurt, uh, which is always exciting to see. Um, so yes, I'd say, uh, yogurt and cheese are getting into schools. Um, as you know, fluid milk is um, one of five meal components that is offered at every um, lunch and one of three components that's offered at every breakfast. So there is a lot of milk. Um, and the vast majority, if not all of the milk that schools are purchasing comes from food um, because they're pretty much the only game in town in terms of who is offering that eight ounce can, that uh, uh, carton. Um, and Hood, while it does source from a regional supply chain um, from dairy producers all around the Northeast, um, there's no way for us to know how much of their product is originating from Vermont. And their processing for those eight ounce cartons happens in their facility in Agawam, Massachusetts. So for those two, with those two factors in mind, <coughs> that product doesn't meet the Vermont local definition. Um, and so one thing I do want to, to note is that this is a question we get often. The milk is fluid milk only, not dairy products broadly. Just fluid milk is currently excluded from the local foods incentive because effectively of a lack of a viable local option. And we didn't want it to count against a school's ability to hit that 15% threshold. So what they do is they add up the amount of money that they spend on milk and they just take that out of their total or their denominator. And we, we calculate their local foods percentage without fluid milk in the consideration at all. Yeah, some Sometime we've got to figure out how much milk does our, our Vermont schools acquire and try to get somebody like Monument Farms or you know, a smaller local producer or processor mm -hmm. to help them put in a, a processing and a packaging yeah. Uh, system to read it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy yeah. to, you know, and the farmers pay to get their milk truck to right. Boston. Right. Well, then Hood pays to truck it. They've got to be paying, hopefully, to truck it back up here for us to drink. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it, it doesn't make any sense. And <clears throat> I would assume that. Uh, you know, if we had a packaging processor here in Vermont, mm -hmm. uh, with between uh, you folks in in Brattleboro and uh, ones in in uh, Hardwick and you know Rotland, yeah. we could figure out a way to distribute that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, plus, they have trucks out. Uh, Monument Farms has. Uh, trucks out delivering, you know, to their local stores. So, um, no, we yeah. we've got to get on to that. Absolutely, it doesn't make any sense. Couldn't agree more. Right. 
you know, and I wonder if it makes sense to partner with our career technical schools with some of this. You know, could a processor, would it make any sense for there to be a processor at a career technical program? You mean like Randolph or what? Well, yeah, Randolph or even one of the you know local high schools for them to learn how, or, or nearby mm -hmm. at least, in some ways partner with. Yeah, so I don't know. So I'm no dairy processing expert. Yeah, and nor am I, clearly, because <laughs> um, I, I brought that idea and everybody's looking at me like I'm crazy. But um, my understanding is that there, there are a number of, of um, you know, smaller and medium-sized okay. farmers that are looking um, to add on-farm processing. Yeah. Um, and again, there's a lot of barriers, and I, I don't yeah. think we have time to get into a lot of the details, but if I could take you just gotta a go yeah, upstairs. I got to go upstairs, but I'll just close with that, one final thought. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah. Take care. If you don't mind, um, I'll maybe put my NOFA hat on for, for a moment here. Um, and this is a question that we're really digging into um, as, as it relates to you know, the institutional market for dairy products exists and it's a stable market. And could there be a solution to support the crisis that we're seeing among organic dairies? And so we're actually yeah. currently doing an institutional market demand study that's funded through the Dairy Business Innovation Center um, to really try to understand, well, could institutions, could schools and hospitals and healthcare and uh, higher ed campuses play a role in supporting these farmers and, and onboarding more organic dairy products? Um, we also will need to figure out that processing. Um, that's definitely something that we're lacking here in Vermont. Again, I'm no expert on that, but I know there are greater minds than mine out there that are working on this issue and looking into it. And I think if we can figure out a viable processing option for uh, for Vermont dairies, and if we could figure out how to package either in bulk packaging or um, or even in those eight ounce cartons, even though they create a lot of waste, um, could we then open up a brand new market for Do our producers? Do schools require that eight ounce, or could it be 10 or 12 ounce? The, and again, that's more, that would be a question I might refer to the Agency of Education to clarify, but I, my understanding is that it's an eight ounce serving, um, but what I don't know is if school, if kids would be allowed to go back and get another milk if they wanted more than that. That's a, that's a question for them. Um, so well, gonna, if they got, instead of calling water, <laughs> right. real, real milk. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately that's an issue um, that, you know, we, is out of our hands here at the state level. Yeah. That is a mandate so, coming from oh, the USDA. Yeah. Even, they just recently, uh, last week, announced some uh, proposed updates to the nutrition guidelines, but it had nothing to do with... Uh, well, they lowered the sugar they're content lowering the sugar. and the colored uh, chocolate exactly. milk. Yes, but it's still required to be 1% or, uh, oh. or, or non-fat milk. Uh, so that's a, that's an issue that's, uh, you know, kind of going to be with us for a long time at a, at a different level. But. Well, and we're working uh, with the pros and the House Committee uh, passed out uh, a tentative uh, help for the organic dairy guys. Excellent. And we're trying to work out a solution for that Excellent. over here of some kind. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've got we've to gotta help them make it through this year so that they can be around to hopefully supply our schools in future years. But the Rooney's uh, at Monument Farms, uh, you know, they're a good, you know, strong Vermont-based uh, company yeah. that uh, if we could get some uh, development money uh, for them to put in a small packaging um, mm -hmm. processing or one, uh, I bet they would be glad to do the work. Uh, yeah. yeah. But that's another one. That's of another, our not to crack another day, but yeah. I very much appreciate your time. Um, well, it's been thank you. Hearing all these Thanks very much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. yeah hope thank to see you at lunch or these extras. Yeah, yeah wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's amazing we took about two hours. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was expecting well, I, you to just zoom through it. But